Great. Welcome, everyone, to this discussion of platforms designed to host participatory science projects brought to you by the NASA Citizen Science Program and the Citizen Science Association. My name is Rihanna Putnam. I'm the program manager for the Citizen Science Association, or as will soon be known, the Association for Advancing Participatory Sciences. We're a member-driven association that works to engage, elevate, and advance the many ways of doing this work, work that goes by many names. One of the exciting things about this field is the coming together of the many different traditions and approaches, something we'll see exemplified by the work being done by these innovative platforms we'll hear from today. As we get started today, please remember um, that we are recording today's event, both to share on the NASA SITSAI Leaders page and also on the CSA website. If you're having any trouble hearing speakers, um, or if you just want to, you can turn on closed captions. Um, that's in the bottom bar, um, I'll say CC. Um, we also have both the chat and Q&A tool open today. We encourage you to put any questions that you have for our panelists to discuss in the Q&A tool. They'll be answering those throughout the show. Um, or you can use the chat for questions or comments. Um, if you haven't already, you're welcome to introduce yourself in the chat. It's always fun to see where people are coming from. Um, you may also notice in the Q&A tool that you can make questions anonymous if you'd like. And there's a box you can check for that. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to our co-host, Sarah Kern, um, the NASA Citizen Science Strategist at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Thanks, Rihanna. Um, so I, I do spend all my time supporting the NASA citizen science community these days, but before my current role, I spent nearly two decades developing and managing citizen community science projects here in Maine, including overseeing the development of a custom platform. So when our first fully functional platform had to be replaced because the version of Drupal that we'd used to build it was no longer supported, I got to know a lot of today's speakers and the platforms that we're featuring as I shopped around to see if that we could avoid redeveloping a custom platform. So I'm bringing a lot of professional and personal experience to today's conversation and feel free to ask me about that later if you like, um, it would be fun to talk about. But for now, I'm going to give you my breezy take on the first important question regarding platforms, which is why choose an existing platform and a little bit about how you go about choosing one. So back one slide, please. Um, so I want to offer you an analogy. Say you need a place to live and you have the choice of a free apartment in one of several buildings. None is perfect. Let's face it. Things rarely work out perfectly. Uh, so one is in a great location, but it's a walk up and you just broke your leg. Another one is where a whole bunch of your colleagues live, but they don't allow pets and you have a dog. Another one is a great, it's conveniently located, amazing views, um, but they don't allow any parties. And the thing that brings you joy is bringing all your friends together and having big barbecues. Your other option is to build your own home with your own money. And you have a perfect lot, it's yours free, but that's all you have, right? There are no utilities. Um, you have no design, you have no materials. But if you can find an architect and an engineer and a builder to work with, you could have exactly what you think you want today. And if it needs to be changed in the future, you could change it again, because it's yours, but it would be all on your dime. Which do you choose? So most people, especially those on a budget, would only do the latter um, building project if they were confident that they could not have a lifestyle that they wanted, that they could live with in any of those free apartments, right? So now you can go to the next slide. It's kind of the same with platforms, right? Um, the platform, if you choose a platform, it's already existing. The one that you choose is gonna give you that framework or foundation to create your project and to create the experience that you want your participants and collaborators to have. But you definitely have constraints. So knowing what it is, what are your must haves versus your nice to haves here is really important for making a good decision. So you definitely will save time. You'll benefit from all the expertise that's been poured into building that platform. You can tap into existing volunteer communities, and they definitely have constraints. There's limited flexibility and you don't have as much control as maybe you think you want. Next slide, Rihanna. Um, but just like with houses, um, no one size fits all. People like different things. We place priority on different things. And thank goodness, right? I mean, even looking at this display of pastries, 
you might choose something different depending on the time of day. So the more choice, um, the more options, the more diversity of things we can offer this great big community, the better for the whole community, right? So for all of us who dream about engaging everyone on the planet and doing some science that's really speaking to them or engaging them for whatever reason, the more different kinds of platforms we have to support that work, the better. So today, next slide, um, we are lucky enough to have the architects or engineers, um, the community organizers from several of those platforms, or think about them as the free apartment buildings, where you might host your project. Um, and they're here to tell us about the kinds of projects and kind of communities that they support. So I'm going to introduce our first speaker and then pass the mic along and they will introduce each other as we go. So first up, we have Kate Bailey. Kate Bailey is the systems developer at the Mount Desert Island Biological Laboratory just down the coast from us here in Maine. And she is the tech guru for Anic Data. Kate, over to you. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. So so I'm Kate Bailey. I've been working here at the MDI Biological Laboratory for over 10 years now. And in fact, the building that I was working at, working at when I first started here, the big one on the um was actually torn down to, to and replaced by the big one that's on the right in that photo you can see there. And um our platform has been heavily influenced by the work that we do um, with. Um, with the environment and also engaging communities in the area. Um, next slide, please. And so what Anecdata is, it's a free online platform for collecting and managing and downloading citizen science data that anybody can use. Anybody can create an account on Anecdata and design their own project. And the data, you can immediately get that data set back out. You can download it, you can an analyze it online and as well, there is an app. And so this has been my, I am the, I've been the developer of this entire platform over the last 10 years. It's been a really great experience. Next slide, please. And so I would say that there's certain um, kinds of projects that work really well for Anecdata. And um, in fact, Anecdata was born out of us not being able to um, collect the kind of data that we needed for our own project, which was trying to find where eelgrass was growing and not growing along the coast of Maine. We needed that absence data and the platforms that we found could not collect that. So if you're collecting just simple biodiversity reports where you're just trying to you know, collect observations of a specific species and that's where we all you're doing, you might wanna use iNaturalist. If you are trying to have people, for example, transcribe old documents or classify photographs, that is really a thing for Zooniverse. But where Enic Data, in my opinion, shines is that we're better at handling um, projects where you've got a more complex data sheet that needs to be filled out, um, for example, or for example, where you are trying to find out where species aren't. Um, if you're doing stuff, for example, we found um, water quality monitoring does really well. Um, anything where people are collecting trash, um, collecting and categorizing trash that they find out in the field. And if you're collecting imagery that's um, not really biodiversity, for example, um, taking, photo taking um, photographs of the sky, we found a lot of that. Next slide, please. And so, um, Currently, we've got over 300 active projects on Anecdata, over 15,500 users, uh, 111,000 observations, and I um, did a little bit of math, and we've got um, 74,000 photographs to date, which is, I believe, I think it's floating around 100 gigabytes of photos altogether. And we've got a bunch of different organizations that are um, using the platform. So far, the organizations, the, the actual organizations that are running projects I found have been ones based out of the US. Next slide, please. And so what we've what we've decided what we've um, realized when we're um, in the course of building out anecdata is that there's no one good model for how people would participate. So for example, um, the original model for participation was open projects, whereby anybody can find your project on Anecdata. 
and they can join it and start share, start entering data into your project. And that works great for some projects, but it doesn't work great, great for others. And so that's when we introduced membership by request and closed memberships. So under by request, you can ask to join and a project administrator will review your request and then approve or deny your request. And then a closed membership is, well, basically the same, except that nobody can request to join and you have to be invited. And just this past year, we've rolled out another model of membership, anonymous participation, whereby you don't even need to have an Anecdata account to enter data. Next slide. And so we've also developed a bunch of ways for people to um, explore the data. And so for example, one way um, that is um, the tabular feed, that's something that, um, I mean, it's, it's a lot like you might see on a social media site where you're just seeing a chronological list of all the, all the observations and you, can, and you can filter them by, you know, who observed them or when or by different vari data variables. Yeah, I, thank you. I think I thought that was a pretty good idea. And um, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting flustered here. And then you can also explore the data by um, in terms of spatial analysis. And it's basically the exact same tools for um, filtering the data. But this way, you get to see everything um, spatially clustered on a map. And then finally, you can also take that same data set that you filtered and you can do an analysis on it. So you want to, you can say, I want to take this variable and I want to plot it against this variable. And um, so for example, in the South Carolina Aquarium's um, litter, litter journal project, um, you can say like, okay, I want to draw a shape around this area and I want to see how many cigarettes are in, are, were collected in it. And you can see that. So next slide. Yeah, and so um, I was going to say that the other cool thing about Anecdata is that we've um, really focused on um, helping people not just share data, but also communicate. And so you can leave comments and observations. And when you comment, uh, a notification goes to the person who, who uploaded it and also everybody else who's commented on it before you. You can also communicate through forums. Every single project has a forum. Um, and, if you put, and if you post in that forum, It'll go out to the um, to everybody in the project, and finally, I did not include a screenshot because I did not want not to screenshot anybody's any of the direct messages I've had with people. But you can um, sh have live chat with other users. Next slide. And we also have integration with SciStarter.org. So if you choose to enable SciStarter on your project, um, we will upload your project's metadata to SciStarter so that it can be found on the uh, SciStarter website. And also if you are a SciStarter user and um, you participate in a SciStarter enabled project, we actually um, log the fact that you participated back with SciStarter. Yeah. So next slide. And so we found some, there's some general trends here. Um, we found that there's been a big emphasis on coastal and marine projects. I think that that's largely because, well, MDI Biological Laboratory is on the coast here in Maine. We found that there's a lot of um, emphasis on project um, on projects with that deal with phenology, with trash and litter. And also uh, something I've noticed is um, informal science education. So there's projects that are doing, so, so for example, there's the um, Lower the Boom project, which was which is run by NASA. And that's um, that involves having people measuring outdoor sound levels with their smartphones. And it's not really being done to, um, it's not really being done for like a um, scientific purpose per se, but it's really, the point of it is really to get people involved in the act of collecting data. And, you know, just to get young people kind of hooked on the process so that they might end, might be, might end up going on into, you know, for example, careers in science. And we found that the big um, people who, the people who mostly run projects are um, nonprofits, academics. And we've also noticed there's been some very dedicated um, K-12 teachers. Um, one of those projects was uh, Space Scurvy, which I thought was pretty cool. 
And of course, there's a um, there's a U.S. bias, U.S. but also interestingly Puerto Rico, and um, we've also had a cluster of projects in Bolivia and Brazil, and there's another cluster in Estonia, and um, <clears throat> Anikid is multi is multi language, but we found that the big languages that get used are English, Spanish, and Portuguese, which kind of makes sense. Bolivia and Brazil. Next slide, please. I guess I should say. I, I should now introduce um, the next presenter, um, Greg Newman at Sitsai.org. And uh, he's got a platform that's quite cool as well. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, Kate is the best. She's doing so much to advance this field. And I have the utmost gratitude for everyone on this panel and for Sarah coordinating. Um, I always uh, like to lead with gratitude and empathy. This is a lot of work. And what you're seeing today is a lot of work by a lot of dedicated people who often volunteer their time to make this happen. So um, huge hats off to everyone and thanks, Kate. Um, so to dive in, I'm Greg Newman, co-founder and director at SITSAI at Colorado State University at the Natural Resource Ecology Lab. And um, well, onward, we, I guess, next slide, we have uh, launched a free open participatory science platform way back in 2007. Um, about the same time INAT launched um, as a platform, and so it's been fun to go on this journey together with, with INAT as well. Um, so this is, of course, a team, and uh, we're grateful to all who have volunteered, um, and uh, we have a lot of students helping us, so this is a bit student-run as well, so hats off to the SITSAI team. Next slide. So SITSAI is a, a participatory science platform powering participatory science projects and all the flavors from community-based monitoring to um, participatory action research and the like in citizen science um, across the globe. And we've been growing since we launched in 07 and people are making fun and cool observations um, like a Petri dish, as you see in this slide at the left. So next slide. So what's been studied on SITSAI? You know, we've we've had the chance to take a look back at what's what folks are doing. And it's just very fun and fascinating to see that they've studied marine systems, animals, conservation, social, air quality, plants, water, insects, birds, weather, invertebrates, food and agriculture, disasters, trash and litter, microorganisms, fungi. We had the great North American fungi count a while back, which was delightful to be involved with, and historical. Um, science uh, work as well. So social sciences largely focused on environmental sciences, but um, as you can see, like much like anecdata, we have heterogeneous support for flexible um, participatory science projects. So next slide. So the platform has an overall arching overview. is It's a free and open platform. It's a, including two big things, a DIY project builder and a DIY data sheet creator. That's super easy and modeled after another platform. Unfortunately, not time to talk about today is Survey123. Um, you just simply drag and drop things, and I'll share that with you in a moment. The backbone of the platform and the, the cyber infrastructure we've built up all supports full GBIF taxonomy support, which of course the Global Biodiversity Information Facility to identify species um, and has many, many integrations I'll talk about later um, and some data visualizations. We've launched this year organization hubs, which is very unique and very helpful for organizations running multiple projects. We need a one-stop plot place and one-stop shop for all of your community science, participatory science endeavors, and we've got a hub for you. And of course, flexible um, governance and privacy, much akin to what Kate had mentioned about Anecdata. So next slide. So key manager features are, of course, creating projects with that DIY project builder, managing members. Um, a, a key thing is assigning of volunteers to sites. A lot of times you want to assign certain volunteers to sites. That's a bit novel and unique um, for us, I think. And, and um, it's been very widely used. Um, and of course, open and member-based projects, public-private data, um, the DIY data sheet creator, Uploading monitor, monitoring locations in bulk has been very popular and quite useful. Um, integrating with other platforms we'll talk about. And, and don't forget program evaluation. There are, of course, ways you can use the platform itself to evaluate success metrics and progress as you go about your project. So next slide. 
Um, participant features, of course, it's a, a, a responsive to all devices, desktop, tablet, mobile, sharing photos, of course, um, viewing data, you know, analyzing to some degree, we'll talk about that, discussing data on forums, and even liking favorites, for example, are all part of the platform. Um, next slide. Uh, flexible membership. I, I'll, I'll put a shout out to Kate. You know, they've launched um, anonymity. We do not do that. So I'll kind of make that a distinguishing factor. Um, we, of course, have open member based and in, in, in invitation based, public, private, and we're working very hard on a very, very sophisticated and we're very excited about an improved location blur blurring algorithm which is not just rounding numbers, but uh, doing a little bit more sophisticated work to blur those locations to protect private locations when you have sensitive species and you don't want poaching of those species, of course, as well. So um, next slide. So this is our data sheet creator I talked about, and it's been modeled after survey one, two, three, given the intuitiveness of that interface. We really focus and pride ourselves on a, a very user-friendly, um, easy to understand interface for all K to gray ages. And so when we worked on that, we found that this simple drag and drop interface, you know, of things that are happening, you know, like a question, you add a question, you just drag and drop it, and then you specify specific things, making it required, um, allowing volunteers to replicate them, makes it very easy for project managers to easily build up a protocol, iterate on that protocol, um, and kind of um, deploy data sheets to volunteers. So next slide. And then, of course, when volunteer observations come in, you get maps, of course, and with directions and easy opportunities to view them. So next slide. And they come in and look like this. This might be an observation, and you can look at them in tabular data and this type of more um, digestible, maybe making sense out of that information kind of page on maps, et cetera. Um, next slide. And then you can look at multiple observations at the same place. And you can do this. We do a lot of work with looking at trend assessments and analyses over time. So you can just flop, flop between observations and trends at this particular location because it has to be measured many times, in this case, 15. And that's quite useful for keeping track, communities keeping track, which is essentially what we see. So next slide. And this is the add, add locations tool. And next slide, you can do that in bulk with your CSV. Um, next slide. And then, of course, analyses and visualizations. Everyone wants more of these. And I think a hat off to and a nod towards field scope. You'll enjoy the presentation coming forward with some pretty novel innovation, innovative um, visualizations. But we, we visualize categorical and numeric data, which is a very important. To, and, we, and we do that over time and space. And we're working on the space part. That's coming this year a little bit more sophisticated from a GIS perspective. So next slide. Um, so, of course, numeric data over time. Um, next slide. And integration. So I'll kind of start to wrap up here. We integrate with SciStarter in the ways Kate mentioned. We've got a little glitch we're working on on the um, event tracker right at the moment as an affiliate, but we'll bring that back online uh, soon. But we've launched um, this past two year, I guess, uh, uh, our integration with the Zooniverse. So people can have crowdsourced photo observations on SITSAI and then have them simultaneously and asynchronously classified by Zooniverse volunteers, um, which you'll learn more about in the next talk from Cliff. Um, and then just last week, we're very excited and proud to launch our Airtable integration, which if anybody's been anywhere in the world these days, You've heard and seen and potentially um, used Airtable as a, a bit of a startup out of California, but it's quite useful as a platform for visualization, analysis, and sharing. So why not it, you port over your citizen science observations to that platform should you choose to use it? Um, so next slide. And of course, all this is feasible because we have an open API and we're really excited about how you, not only can we integrate with things like Airtable, um, Meetup, I, Google, uh, we're going to have single sign-on with Google real soon and, and with SciStarter. So the, the advantage of an open API is, is that you don't have to build everything in your platform. You could fire off a workflow like a Zapier Zap and zap something over to Outlook and post an event and share that with that app, right? Or you could do that with Sign Up Genius or Meetup. And so the advantage is, is that 
because we have an API, uh, those companies can work with us and we can work with them. And so everything we do and is done on SIDSI that I've shared with you today is done through our API. So we use our API to get tasks and workflows streamlined for participants. And you can use it to build your own mobile app, for example. You could use it to build your own web application. You could use it to embed SITSI data in your own website, for example. So you just authenticate with the API and, and access the data that way, which is quite useful. So next slide. So to wrap up, we're a good fit when you're running projects and you have a, an organization that has many participatory science projects. You have complicated data collection with a lot of heterogeneous data, presence, absence data, height, weight. Um, number of bags collected, et cetera. Um, you run, maybe run statewide programs. You want to use our Zooniverse integration. Um, we do quite well with water quality. Um, we have the ability to assign sites to volunteers. And of course, maybe you might want to use the openness of our open API. Not so great for checklists. Go to eBird, go to INAT. Um, presence only, go to INAT. Um, need AI-based species identification, we are not your platform. Um, and then anonymous participation as flagged by Kate is a really great opportunity for those needing that um, at on Anic Data. Image classification, Cliff will talk about on Zooniverse and education we'll hear about soon with Globe and FieldScope. So with that, I'll wrap up. Hopefully I'm on time. <laughs> Thank you. And onward to Cliff, um, who hails from the Zooniverse. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, great to hear and great to join everyone today. Um, yeah, my name is Cliff Johnson. Uh, I'm co-director of the Zooniverse and based out of Adler Planetarium and Northwestern University in Chicago. Uh, and I'm here representing the Zooniverse platform, um, which is a, a combination and kind of uh, managed through a collaboration of the Adler Planetarium, the University of Minnesota, and the University of Oxford. Next slide, please. Uh, so the Zooniverse uh, is a free online platform for people-powered research. Uh, to just kind of give uh, a quick kind of quick hits, um, some of our kind of relevant stats. Um, so we have about 100 active projects on the platform right now, um, and greater than 400 total projects, uh, approved projects, have been launched uh, on the platform since uh, our very beginning in 2009. And about since 2017, uh, we've been launching about uh, an average of about a project a week. Um, and that's uh, due to our project builder platform, which I will talk in greater detail in just a few minutes. Um, but one of the biggest assets is our community. Um, so we have over 2.6 million registered volunteers uh, and they are the lifeblood and are able to kind of keep this large and uh, diverse set of projects um, moving. And I'll just point out that uh, while we kind of bias towards um, astronomy projects and space related projects, because that's where we started, um, but uh, we have actually a wide range of different domains represented on the platform, ecology, humanities, biomedical, and even more. Um, and uh, those projects uh, produce um, over 150,000 uh, classifications per day. And um, to date, we've actually had over 400 publications kind of emerge um, from these different projects. Next slide. So to kind of give you a flavor, uh, no better place to start than the very beginning. So Galaxy Zoo um, is probably our most notable project. It was our first project um, and actually even predates the platform itself. Um, but uh, this is a very good representation of kind of the, the, the typical project. Um, if you have a large data set that needs um, crowdsourced labeling and analysis, um, bring it onto the platform and we will show it to our you know large pool of volunteers and be able to get uh, kind of um, overall uh, consensus classifications um, that provide very good data quality. And so here uh, is actually um, showing some brand new James Webb Space Telescope data uh, in our Galaxy Zoo project, um, being able to classify um, morphologically um, the different galaxies. And so kind of as a typical example, um, uh, the Galaxy Zoo and its, its most latest incarnation, which was looking at the decals data set, uh, was 314,000 images and 7.5 million classifications. A more typical project on the platform is um, slightly lower in number, um, probably between 10 and 100,000 subjects, but on the larger size. Um, and then those, prob those projects probably need between 100,000 and a million classifications. Um, and uh, each of those projects um, that are kind of launched as approved projects are attracting between one and 10,000 volunteers. Next slide, please. 
Um, so the part that makes us a platform is that very early on, um, we realized that uh, even um, kind of the tools that we're using for, you know, Galaxy Zoo and a few other um, projects were very applicable to many, many different fields. And so it did not take very long before uh, we were working with ecology teams and um, and uh, camera trappers and many, many, many other um, kind of domains. And really the core here is that um, for, you know, bringing uh, uh, different sets of data, whether that be image, video, text, even JSON, kind of uh, just like point data for um, putting it onto plots or even audio data, um, all of these kind of pieces of data can be classified in a similar way. And so we've kind of uh, been able to create marking tools, multiple choice questions, free text entry, drop down tasks. Um, and these kind of common set of tools have been very useful across all these different projects. So here looking at ecology projects to even um, kind of humanities and transcription projects. Next slide, please. Um, and all of this is driven by our free project builder platform. Um, this is set up in a very DIY way. Uh, as you can tell, that that is definitely a good way of being able to kind of increase bandwidth and provide tools for research teams. And so the interface kind of uh, I'm showing you here for actually a project I ran myself. Um, it's a lot of kind of fill in the blanks um, for being able to enter in the data, um, being able to construct workflows and kind of uh, assemble the different tasks that you want to piece together in order to be able to analyze the data that you're looking at. Next slide. And so I just wanted to highlight a few of the additional features. Um, so a very core piece that we're very proud of um, is our talk product. So there's uh, it's basically a discussion forum, um, commenting and private, private messaging um, uh, uh, app within within this universe. And that is attached to each of our individual projects. I mean, this is really the lifeblood of being able to have volunteers interacting with the research teams, being able to ask questions, being able to point out interesting um, interesting pieces of data in the data sets, um, and is why actually a lot of the research teams and the volunteers are attracted to these universe projects. Um, uh, we also have translations ability and a mobile app. Um, next slide, please. And I also did want to highlight a couple of the kind of research facing tools we have. Um, so uh, similar to um, kind of the sit side of uh, talking about um, kind of an open API, we do have programmatic access um, uh, through a RESTful API, and that's very useful for, pro for project management. So you can imagine um, a uh, actually one of our projects actually looking at um, asteroids, trying to do asteroid identification, actually being able to hook up um, in kind of a pipelines kind of way of uh, data coming out of their um, kind of data reduction pipelines and being able to transfer that um, automatically um, into a Zooniverse project and have it classified. So that's um, that's a great way. Uh, we also have, um, so to use the that API, we have some client tools, some command line tools, um, and also have um, uh, an app called Caesar, which allows for some real-time data orchestration to be able to do some of the analysis kind of on the fly. And so all of these kind of pieces put together can actually make a very, very good platform for being able to incorporate external machine learning systems. Um, and we've worked with a number of teams in order to, um, if they've got um, an AI or ML kind of a model that they've, they'd like to apply to their data, um, we can have some really active back and forth um, in order to create kind of hybrid workflows um, to get that data classified. Um, and finally, uh, wanting to point out that uh, we do have, in terms of data analysis assistance, um, an aggregation software package that is available for teams. Um, and especially I'll highlight for NASA teams um, through a NASA's universe partnership, which I'll talk about in a little bit more detail later. Um, we actually do have the availability of data scientists at the University of Minnesota um, available for consultations. So if you're ready to build a project, uh, I encourage you to get started and take a look at the project builder um, and you will go through a review, a review project. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, we will go through a beta review, an internal review and get you into launch. Next slide. And just to wrap up, um, I think the powers of Zooniverse really are in that large data set. Um, if you really need the large crowd um, in order to get through like enormous, uh, enormous piece of data, um, we are really a good fit. Um, I will highlight from the poor fit um, data collection projects. Uh, everything is meant to be that the research team is the one submitting the subjects and the images. 
Um, so there are plenty of other um, uh, platforms and integrations to help there. Um, or if you really need very highly custom interfaces of tools. Um, really, if you are eager to use proven tools and um, can make kind of our existing tools that work for you, then that's great. Also just highlighting that um, large scale restricted uh, participation and for sensitive data are both not very great fits for this universe. And then as we, next slide, and as we are here sponsored by NASA Citizen Science, I'll just end by saying that uh, we've been very successful um, hosting 12 active projects, actually 19 total projects over the three-year partnership that we've gotten with NASA. Um, and uh, just as I think uh, a show of um, kind of support and encouragement for teams using the Zuniverse platform, actually 10 out of the 24 total awards for the Citizen Science Seed Funding Program, a very interesting grant program from NASA, um, has actually been using the Zuniverse platform in order to run those projects. So I think that's a great, um, great uh, kind of uh, vote of confidence on that uh, we're moving in the right direction. And with that, I'll wrap up and thank you so much. And I'll uh, introduce Jessica, thank you. Thank you, can everyone hear me? It's great to be here um, with all of you. This is amazing. Thank you again for coordinating. My name is Jessica Bean. Um, I'm actually based at UC Berkeley and I partner with FieldScope, uh, which is based at BSCS Science Learning, but has a long history um, and was previously actually at National Geographic. Um, and so I'm really happy to be here today, actually as the most recent member or addition to the FieldScope team as the Director of Outreach and Science. Uh, and I will tell you that I actually came to FieldScope to be working with FieldScope because I brought a project to FieldScope. I was actually working with a young student in India who was creating a new low cost uh, citizen community science project uh, about water quality and trying to understand eutrophication and the pollution of the lakes in her community and trying to address the environmental justice issues that they were facing. Um, and she was really seeking a way to analyze that data and make that data public and have the community engage with the data in meaningful ways. And that was why we found FieldScope, <laughs> which then led to me actually continuing the collaboration and working with this project and across the many projects that we host. So again, really happy to be here. And next slide, please. So FieldScope is a map-based data collection and analysis platform. And again, that analysis part um, is what we really try to emphasize is supporting communities in figuring out what are the educational resources and programs that we can design or co-design co with you um, to really support the, um, the exploration of the data. Um, so there's we can host and help collect the data, but we also really want to support um, how you're exploring the data, how you're making sense of the data. So the idea is that we're making meaning of data and we're turning those data into powerful stories that, again, address the social and environmental justice issues that communities might be um, challenged with. Um, and we partner deeply with some of those communities to support their efforts um, in the way that they make data available um, and accessible in communities. Uh, you, what you see here is actually some of the examples of data visualizations um, on FieldScope that you can create um, with some clicks of the button. The idea is to make data visualization really accessible um, for younger users and just general you know, community members um, who may have little to no experience with data analysis. Um, and you can save and edit and share these types of visualizations um, uh, online, uh, which is really, really a wonderful tool. So next slide, please. So if you go to our homepage, oops, if you go to our homepage, um, you'll see there's a section called join a project. Um, and then there's also a lot of information about launching your own project. And I'll talk about a little, a little bit about that today. Um, so if you go to the next slide, please. So on our join a project page, you'll see um, many of our active projects. I should say that we host both public and private projects. Um, you have lots of options with FieldScope for how public or how private you want the project and the data to be. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a second about managing your project. Um, but these are just some of the examples of the projects that we have and work in, you know, across geographic sizes. Um, so we have international and national projects. Um, some of our most well-known projects include Frogwatch USA. Um, we host data from Budburst and Globe at Night. 
um, we use APIs to, and we, uh, you know, host that data um, that can be then again used for data analysis and visualization. We're really interested in also being a platform where, you know, again, we can host data that might be collected in another platform, like Budburst has its own app, but we're able to pull that data into FieldScope and then be able to work with it using our visualization um, and analysis tools. Um, and so again, we work from these larger national and international projects. Water Insights is another one. That's the one I mentioned that was started by a young student in India who I was partnering with, Sahiti Pingali. Um, and then I also, we also work at the very hyper-local level. So for example, the local AIA Foundation that you see all the way there on the right, um, that's about monitoring very, spe very specific fish ponds um, on the island of Oahu in Hawaii to understand the state and of those fish ponds um, that are very um, important on the island. Um, so again, we work at lots of different levels from national, international to local, and we have over 24,000 participants across our projects. Um, next slide, please. So again, this is an example of the field scope interface when you're working um, with the data to create visualizations and maps. And one of the great things that you can do, as you can see there on the left, is you can filter the data. You can start to work with the data and filter it by you know, the date or a value um, or a number or an area. Um, and so this is actually Water Insights data that I mentioned from that project that I worked on with Sahiti. Next slide. And so this is an example of how you can filter by area. You can draw a circle around a particular part of the map. So I work with teachers in Santa Cruz, California, who are using Sahiti's protocol to understand nutrient levels in local waterways. Um, so they can go in and they can filter the data that's specifically theirs that they collected as a class. Next slide. And then with that filter data, with their data set, they can select from a number of options, creating histograms and bar graphs, doing numeric summaries, creating scatter plots or time series or range plots, um, and of course, making maps with all sorts of symbologies to be able to visualize the data um, on, on the map itself. Next slide. So these are again data from SoCal High School um, in Santa Cruz, uh, California. Um, and so for example, if you wanted to see like what kinds of water samples were collected um, and analyzed over, you know, over the course of those couple of years that they've been using the protocol so far, you could make a bar graph using these pull down menus that you see on the left side. Um, so again, the idea is to make um, these types of graphs and visualizations really accessible. You don't have to learn Excel, Excel or R, um, but we give you those menu options and students can start playing with and visualizing the data um, fairly easily. And it's all in one platform. Um, students are also submitting their data for this project in the platform as well. This is one of, one of those projects where both the collection and the analysis are happening in the platform. So this is showing, you know, again, water analysis, uh, you know, how, how, um, how uh, what types of water have been uh, have been collected? Next slide. And then we could create maps that show things like um, coloring, you know, using symbologies to color by pH level um, variation across the sampling area. And next slide. And you can change that symbology, and you can change the base map. And we also have the capacity to import various types of layers, um, again, to enhance that data exploration. Um, so you can see some of the, the options for base maps that are available there. Um, and there can be specific maps that you want to import for your project. Um, currently, we use ArcGIS to be able to import um, these map layers. So this is a color by nitrate uh, level um, on that map that you see. Next slide. And so again, you can actually, you know, create and then save these types of visualizations and make them accessible to other users. Um, this is just showing you an example of a saved visualization that includes a few different, um, different pieces. Next one, next slide. So again, sort of to summarize, so you know, FieldScope provides a shared project database, um, and it's a mobile-friendly browser-based platform. So there's no app, um, but that makes it um, again compatible across platforms. Um, and we are very conscious, of course, of making it mobile-friendly because people are uploading a lot of data from their phones. We also have a new offline mode, which means that if you lose connectivity or you load the FieldScope page before um, you go out in the field and lose connectivity, that will be saved in the browser and then uploaded once you reconnect um, to the internet. Um, and so um, you, we can support photos and audios and videos. That being said, I do want to say that we don't have the capacity that, that platforms like Zooniverse have for you know, video or data um, or, or photo analysis, but we can host um, large files and you can attach those to your various observations. 
Um, and then as you just I just showed you, um, we have these data visualization analysis tools, and we have the capacity for embedding these visualizations in other websites, um, which is really great. We also have lots of tools for project managers, again, depending on how public or private you want this, um, your data and the project to be, and then tools for groups. So for example, we have projects like Frog Watch that have many, many chapters, and, and project managers want to be able to uh, support those chapters in the work that they do. So next slide, please. And um, as was alluded to earlier, I think by Greg, uh, we also again have a very strong educational focus in the work that we do with Field Scope. And we even have a whole set of activities, lessons, uh, two to three hour lessons that can be done both in and outside of formal education settings called the Invitations to Inquiry. Um, and the idea is to provide an authentic experience with environmental data and make this accessible for students, um, especially being responsive to the next generation science standards. And so we really do love partnering with projects to figure out how do you create these types of learning experiences and stepping stones to make teachers and community members and students more comfortable in exploring and working with the data. Um, and so I can tell you right now, we're in the process of actually designing um, various uh, per, you know, workshops and meetings um, with community members to support their exploration of the data as part of their projects. Next slide, please. And just to tell you again, we're really involved in how field scope projects launch. We love meeting with you, talking about your project, supporting you as you design it. Um, again, engaging with you and figuring out what kinds of community engagement you might be doing that involves data visualization and analysis. And then we have a test, you know, a testing period and you can complete our license and then we go live. Um, but again, we really love working with you and partnering with you in that process. Next slide, please. So thank you. Please reach out if you have any questions. I'm really gr grateful um, for our funding and our partners. And next slide, I'm really excited to introduce to you Carrie Seltzer, who is on the leadership team for iNaturalist. Thanks, Jessica. So I first want to say thank you all for attending. And it's a pleasure to talk with so many other great representatives from other platforms. I do want to say that we're, we're going from the more general platforms to the sort of more specific niche interest platforms. So unless you're doing a project with biodiversity, this part might not be very interesting for you. Next slide. iNaturalist is an independent nonprofit with a mission to connect people to nature through technology, specifically biodiversity, and to advance science and conservation through the data and insights collectively generated through the platform. So we are really focused on helping people do one thing, which is make and share observations of biodiversity. This is sort of a haphazard occurrence record. So you see a butterfly, you take a picture, you post it to iNaturalist, and even if you don't know what you saw, that's okay because other people in the community can help identify it. We've also got a tool um, from machine learning. We call it our computer vision model that will make suggestions. It's essentially a kind of AI. And then collectively, through all of the millions of records contributed and identified by the community, interesting insights and discoveries can emerge. Next. So this, so iNaturalist can be a good fit if you're really interested in presence only biodiversity records. So as Kate mentioned with ANIC data, if you want to record, explicitly record absence, like the example she mentioned with eelgrass, iNaturalist isn't, isn't a good fit for that because you can say, Eelgrass is here, but you can't say it's not here. <laughs> uh, iNaturalist is also a great fit if you want to leverage existing biodiversity data on iNaturalist and the existing infrastructure and community and expertise. We have an extensive website as well as mobile apps for iOS and Android. It's also a good fit if you're willing to get involved and learn how to use iNat yourself. It's always important to really really understand what the experience is like before you're encouraging other people to use it. And it's a good fit if you've got an intrinsically motivated audience as opposed to um, a circumstance where someone is going to be required to participate, um, for example, through coursework or something like that. 
just to reiterate a few things, INS not a great fit if you're working with checklists. Um, Greg also mentioned this um, in the context of birding. That's what eBird does really well with checklists. Um, when it comes to biodiversity data with sort of more complex data requirements, iNaturalist might not be a very good fit. Unlike um, Kate mentioned with ANIC data, we don't have a way to have anonymous participation in iNaturalist. You don't have to share your real name by any means, but everyone does need to have an iNaturalist account. Um, and it's not a good fit for kids under 13, that we do have a parental approval process, um, but it's really a very small audience that uses that. Um, and like I mentioned, it, it can be tricky with students. Um, there are some educators who do amazing stuff with students, but um, I think the most important thing to understand is that we don't have special student accounts. Um, everyone has the same kind of account. Um, and so you really need to think carefully before, um, before uh, working with students if that's a primary audience. Next. So the kinds of data that we collect by default on iNaturalist, when you make an observation of that butterfly, for example, um, it has to be associated with an account. So to some extent, that's who you are. We need to know where you saw it in terms of the, the coordinates. When you saw it, we ask for evidence of what you saw. Usually that's in the form of a photograph, but can also be in the form of an audio recording. And then this piece of what you saw, like I said, you might know it. You might know that you're looking at a Gulf fritillary butterfly or something. Um, but if you don't, that's okay, because that's where our AI can be helpful in terms of making some suggestions. And that's really where the community of nature lovers that has a wealth of expertise can also come into play. Next. So broadly speaking, we've got two main types of projects that you can create in iNaturalist. And by far the most commonly used one is something that we call a collection project. And these are very easy to set up as long as you're able to easily filter out the kinds of observations that you want to be included in a project. So these are excellent for place-based projects, time-bound projects, taxonomically specific projects, or projects with a particular group of people who, who you want to join the project. This example that I'm showing is from a recent event that happened, it's a, a watershed um, bio blitz. Um, this is the Anacostia River, which is in DC where I am and Maryland. And they've for, seven years now had this annual event over a few days in September. So we've got on the stats page for each project page, you can see how many observations, the breakdown of species and their major taxonomic groups, as well as how many identifications have been contributed by other members of the community. And so that's easy because it's just automatically collecting things. Um, it makes it sort of very low barrier to entry for participation. Next. Then we've got something called traditional projects. And this is how projects started on iNaturalist, which is where that name comes from. But this is good if filters won't work for capturing the, the kinds of observations that you want. And I think an excellent example of that is this project called Never Home Alone, The Wildlife of Homes. And this is just what it sounds like. These are things that people find in their house. And we don't have any way of filtering those things out because we don't ask people to record, like, was it inside? Um, and so you just have to, when you make your observation, you can choose to add it to a project. Um, and so when I find spiders in my house, for example, I take pictures of them and I add them to the Never Home Alone project so that they show up here. I do also want to mention that, um, that iNaturalist, you can kind of think of iNaturalist as like one big project in itself. It's it's like its own sort of city. And you can, if, if you want to do a project with biodiversity, you can kind of like set up your own shop in that city and you can it, you can advertise and you can invite people to to come to that. And some people might just be walking by and they might, might join your project that way. Um, but uh, you don't have to 
people can contribute to to iNaturalist without joining any projects. And I think that is one way that iNaturalist is different than um, some of the other, the previous um, platforms um, because uh, you, you it just kind of is, is a mega project, if that makes sense. Next. All right. Um, I wanted to mention that one of the benefits of working with iNaturalist is that we've got some, some things happening that you can just take advantage of. One is that on a weekly basis, we generate data to share with the Global Biodiversity Information Facility, um, which is an aggregator of biodiversity data of many, many types, including sitsci.org um, observations as well, and many other platforms. There are more than 4,000 publications that have used iNaturalist data to date. Um, the AI model that we have that makes species suggestions works for the about 70,000 most commonly recorded species on iNaturalist, and we update that once a month now, the new, new ones coming out today. Um, there are, there's just hundreds of new undescribed or rediscovered species just out there already. There's so much data already on iNaturalist that um, that if, if that's a area of interest, you can take advantage of it. And just for scale, um, since iNaturalist launched in 2008, uh, more than 2.8 million people have contributed observations. Next. Um, this is just a snapshot of one hour on iNaturalist and the orange dots represent where an observation was made. And the line indicates where the identifier who added an identification to that observation was located. So you can see that there is this global exchange of knowledge happening on iNaturalist every hour of every day. Um, if I have a minute, I just, it looks like I have one minute. Um, I just wanted to mention a couple things that I thought of while other people were talking that I did not include in my slides. One is that iNaturalist is multilingual. It's been translated into dozens of languages, both the website and the mobile app. Um, and we also have an API. Um, and we do have some options for obscuring the precise locations, both for personal privacy and for protection of sensitive species. With that, I'm happy to turn it over to Holly to talk about GLOBE. Thank you, Carrie. So I'm Holly Cole, um, speaking on behalf of the GLOBE program and GLOBE Observer. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So GLOBE is an international science and education program that um, is used for environmental data collection. And I guess my first question is, is GLOBE, is the GLOBE program a platform? And the answer is, well, sort of. Um, if you are talking about, like we've been talking about um, with many of these other projects, you know, bringing your idea um, to GLOBE to plug it in and put it inside the, the program for implementation, maybe not. Um, and since we're talking to the NASA SITSAI leaders, I'll use a NASA analogy. GLOBE is a whole lot more like a satellite. You have these Pre, these instruments that you design to look at very specific things, but the things they're looking at are um, of broad interest. So they might be used for a lot of different types of research or applications, um, but you're not going to be able to go tweak those instruments once they're up in space on that satellite. And GLOBE is a lot, is a lot like that. Um, and GLOBE Observer, just as a definition, is um, the app of the GLOBE program. So GLOBE um, is implemented through a series of bilateral agreements between the U.S. government and those of uh, those governments of other countries, of 127 countries. So making changes when you have all of those agreements in play is really difficult. Go ahead and go to the next slide. But um, GLOBE is a platform of a sort because if you're collecting environmental data, there's a really good chance that GLOBE has a protocol that is doing that already. So can you work with a GLOBE protocol? And I listed down here at the bottom, I'm not going to go through this, um, all the GLOBE protocols. And that's all on the GLOBE website. The ones in kind of red orange are the ones that are inside the GLOBE Observer app is a app-based data collection protocol that, that anybody can use without training. The other ones require a little bit additional training. Okay, go ahead and go to the next slide. 
So why, why would using GLOBE for your project be of value to you? Well, as you saw on the prior slide, GLOBE has nearly 50 predefined protocols. And then if you start looking at combinations of protocols, um, you have even more options. And those protocols each include training and support materials, so you don't have to create that. Um, we have a free and open database, so you don't have to manage the database, and the data are there to, for anybody to go grab and use. There are more than 240 million measurements in the database to date, and those go back to 1990, uh, Globe launched in 94 with real implementation in 95. And so you can go back in time, and because the protocols are consistent, you can then use those to build forward. And so you get some nice rich history there. Um, we do have the Globe Observer app for data collection and data entry that uh, we support. And then we have an existing volunteer base, uh, largely in schools, but we also have individual volunteers and we are global. Um, and then uh, I think Sarah brought these points up early, earlier on in the session. Uh, you know, we do the registration, the user management, permissions, privacy, all of that is managed. I'm going to go to the next slide. So we do have a few tools to make it easier for people to build projects within GLOBE, within the bounds that I've already talked about here. And one of them is GLOBE Teams. And this is the simplest way to get going in GLOBE. It allows you to organize a group for collective action. So when you create a team, and anyone can create a team, uh, you can see who is in your group. Um, all the users have um, anonymous alphanumeric code assigned to them, or they can choose a, a, an anonymous name. Um, and then, um, so you can see all your users, you can see what they have done, you can see the location of the data they've collected, you can download the data by team, um, you can constrain the, the team activity to a certain date. Um, so it, it provides a lot of flexibility for working together to collect data for a end, end purpose. Uh, these teams can be open, as in anybody can join them, or they can be closed um, in that you have to issue an invitation to, to somebody and give them a, a participation code for them to join your team. Okay, next. The other tool that we are just bringing out of stage one pilot into a, a second phase of pilot is um, this science data or data request function. Um, so what that means is that you can create a project and ask uh, participants to go, volunteers to go collect data for your project in a particular geographic region. And right now it's built only on the four app-based protocols, which are clouds, mosquito, habitats, land cover, and trees um, is, is the pilot phase. Um, and it's only in the United States for the moment. Uh, but it, it has been a really interesting tool to enable people to create their own projects. And you have the ability to, to link off to you know, a, play, a secondary website or a place on our website where you can ask people to say, collect secondary data. So for example, I might be asking somebody to um, observe um, habitat of uh, an owl in a particular region. And then um, once they're there, if they see it, go use iNaturalist to document its presence. And so you can, you can create those kind of blended projects using this function. Go ahead and go to the next slide. I wanted to provide a couple of examples. Um, one project that is using Globe Observer is the NASA funded Fresh Eyes on Ice. Um, they're using um, a number of platforms. They're, they have four different ones that they're using and they're using projects that their community is already familiar with. They work with indigenous communities to monitor river ice um, freeze up and then break up in Alaska because those rivers become highways. Um, and so safety is a major issue if you have people out on the ice. And so their, their communities are monitoring ice conditions. And um, they use GLOBE as a tool for doing that. The other one I wanted to show you is a, is a much smaller scale. This is a small community um, where they are concerned about mosquito habitats in their neighborhood. And this really is just a little tiny neighborhood, but they applied to use this um, science data request or community-based um, data requests where they're just wondering where are the mosquito habitats in our community and what can we do to mitigate the mosquito population without using pesticides extensively. 
So um, they're using this this project, and within that, they're also asking people to set up um, mosquito traps to identify the species of mosquitoes they have in their neighborhood. So that's another one of a blended uh, blended citizen science project. Go ahead and go to the next slide. The last two I wanted to share with you, um, the NASA SNOWX um, build campaign is uh, putting instruments on an airplane and then flying them over um, a defined path to measure um, snow. And they wanted ground-based measurements to match up with that path. So they went to the GLOBE community, and this is one where they went to the, the student-based community um, and asked them, yeah, the schools in the path of their, their flight to monitor snow conditions during those flights. Um, so they had that, that ground-based data for a short period of time uh, based on GLOBE protocols. And the last project, we had some scientists that we've been working with who are really interested in presence of dust. And we don't have a dust protocol, but we do have a clouds protocol that basically collects the same information. And so we worked with them to create a set of instructions to use our existing protocol to get the type of data that they need um, for their their project. So these are all the kinds of different ways that we have worked with people to set up um, research projects underneath the globe umbrella. Um, so it's a little different than the typical platform that we've talked about before, but uh, it still provides a lot of power and opportunities. Um, I did not, I forgot to include this, but some of the, the things that we have to help, we have an, an API in and out, um, and then we have these tools as well. We're also um, SciStarter affiliates to help connect and integrate with other projects. That is it for me. So I'm gonna hand it back over to Rihanna to um, begin our discussion. Awesome, thanks so much, Holly, and to all of our panelists today. Um, as Jennifer commented in the chat at the top of the call, the collegiality of the leaders in this field is just so inspiring. Um, from the outside, someone can see these platforms as competitors, but there's such a spirit of mutual support and collaboration across these teams, and it's really something special. So this has been a lot of information, and it was really great to hear from all of these platforms today. We have done our best to summarize some of these key takeaways into a blog post that we hope will be a great resource for you when sharing about platforms with your colleagues who might be interested in starting a new project. Um, you can find that on the citizenscience.org website. Um, that QR code goes there. We'll also try to pop it in the chat. Um, on the web page, we acknowledge, and we want to acknowledge here today, that there are lots of other platforms. We heard from six today, but we know that there are many, many more. Um, I know I saw Charmel on the call earlier from ArcGIS. Um, she is our one of CSA's data and metadata co-chairs and does a lot with Survey123 that Greg mentioned. Um, Google Forms is a very low cost, easy access platform that a lot of projects can start um, collecting with. And then all sorts of different ones from small scale to big scale. Um, so lots of platforms on the blog posts. We also wanted to mention SciStarter, which several of the platforms mentioned that they have API integrations and integrations with SciStarter. SciStarter is not a platform for data collection and classification, but it is a powerful tool for um, participatory science projects. It can help project leaders amplify their projects, recruit more participants, and learn about their participant experience and interest while accelerating their scientific research. Um, so if you haven't already added your project to SciStarter, it's a great thing to do. They also have some API tools um, that you can learn about on their website. Um, there's a QR code and we'll pop a link in the chat to learn more about that. And then lastly, to help you all digest all this information and make informed decisions about when choosing a platform, uh, Sarah and I brainstormed some questions that you might want to consider. So we have 10 questions and some follow-ups, just ways for you to think through what are your project needs and how might these platforms support that. Um, so we won't go into that in depth here, but you can find that again on that blog post. Um, and I think one of the exciting things about today's event is that we have an opportunity to chat with all of the platform leaders today um, and to kick us off with that conversation. We have Mark Kutchner, the NASA Citizen Science lead on, and he's going to lead our discussion. Oh, boy. Hey. 
Rihanna, thanks so much. Oh my goodness, what terrific, what terrific talks and what terrific just contributions to 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 humanity. I want to thank. I just want to stand up and applaud all of you for the work you've done for just letting this everything happen. I mean, it's changed my life. It's changed so many lives, and um, I'm really grateful. Um, with that, I've got lots of questions, um, and I hope you'll take all of these, um, you know, the way they're meant, which is, I'm just so interested in what you're doing, and I just want to know more. Um, so I want to start by talking about languages. Um, hopefully this is a fun one. Um, you know, uh, several of you mentioned, uh, Kate mentioned Portuguese and Spanish, Universe has a translation tool. Um, Holly's talked about 127 different countries. Um, so tell me, besides, once you've got a translation out there, what's the next step for bringing a project to that new language audience? Anybody want to take that one? Raise your hand. You got I'll, cool. okay. I'll start, but I sh I want to put a shout out towards Kate and what she's done to crowdsource translations, which is quite innovative. Um, and of course, everything INAT's done. Um, one of our wildly popular projects was in Vietnam and all conducted in Vietnamese. Um, so yes, translation's a step. What's the next step? And yeah. I think I think I'd advocate to mention... And there's a bit of a discussion in chat. So colleagues of mine in South Africa at Cyber Tracker have been wrestling with that next step. There's, there's two things to that. One, one is bringing platforms that are translated into different audiences, which we can talk about. That's logistics and, and important and challenging. But there's also reaching um, illiterate trackers, for example. So like we talk about languages, but moving beyond languages Cyber Tracker has pushed the bounds and they've written some papers on how to do that in Botswana, for example, with icon-based data entry apps. So I think we need to push ourselves as a field and as platforms to figure out, A, how to do what you're doing, Mark, which I, I, I wish I had all the answers and I don't. How do you bring these sorts of technologies into other places, other languages, and other contexts that may not even have a written language. So um, I think we need to do better. And I think the ways to do that in the case, the latter is icon-based systems. And I think the way to do that logistically is really partner. Partner with people in place who have the networks to bring platforms and technologies to places where there's other languages. So my, my first best guess. Cool. Thanks, Greg. I can I can add to that um, to clarify what I mean or sort of how iNaturalist is translated into many different languages. Um, this I think similar to Anecdata, our translations are crowdsourced. So we use a platform called Crowdin, and the content on iNaturalist that is translated is the interface and and some of the supporting explanations. But the user generated content is not translated. So, for example, if you want to use iNaturalist for a project and your audience is Spanish speaking, if you make your project, all of the written content associated with your project in Spanish, it will, every, everyone will see it in Spanish. Um, and when you open the iNaturalist app, if your device is set to Spanish, that the app will open in Spanish. If your browser is set to Spanish, the website will, will open in Spanish, but your project content will only appear in the language that you put it in. Nice. That's that's a cool feature. I I'd never even even seen. Um, how would you say how effective do you think these these experiments that you you've all been trying with translation? How effective do you think they are? Do you think you're actually do do the statistics show that you're getting a lot of responses in these other languages? Um, I would like to highlight that I think one of the challenges about um kind of internationalization of project content um, is making sure that there is proper support. And so, you know, from the sense of a Zooniverse project, most most volunteers are there because they're interested in being able to interact 
um, with the researchers. And fundamentally, that's going to be a limitation for many teams of can the researchers themselves communicate um, in other languages and be able to kind of provide that same really valuable experience um, that some of our kind of, I, I think, English speaking colleagues are. So, I mean, and that's coming from experience on Zuniverse of we've seen some good successes, but it's when the research teams themselves have had those skills and abilities um, in order to kind of communicate and and drive engagement in that way. Yeah, I, 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 Go ahead, Kate, take it away. Oh, oh I was going to say that um, in my experience, the, uh, the, pro the, the, the great bulk of our translations have come from projects where the administrators of said projects were in that other country, whether it's you know Poland or Vietnam or Brazil, and they provide those trans and they enter those translations because they themselves are those are the speakers. So it's not it's not something where the, where you've got you know a project that's being run by people who are all you know from the Anglosphere, and you know they just they just want to have participant participants in who speak yeah. some other language hmm. um yeah i second that ditto yeah the the and to cliff's point too you know the project manager in our vietnamese example was from the mekong environment forum and the u.s state department totally embedded in that community spoke vietnamese and was able to champion it in all the ways that are internationalized beyond the words on the screen if that makes sense yeah, and just briefly, I didn't mention it before, but iNaturalist has formal collaborations with institutions in 21 other countries outside the United States. And, and that's a huge part of our international reach. And there, a lot of them are very involved in translation and certainly in um, building communities and especially local language communities. Um, and so it wouldn't, it wouldn't be possible without those collaborations. And just want to emphasize, because I don't think I did it enough, like INAT only works because of so many people who, who, um, who are, are dedicated to it. So huge gratitude to everyone. Very good. Um, thanks, Carrie. Um, so if you don't have a PI who's in a certain country, does that mean it's hopeless to extend beyond that language sphere? I think it helps to find somebody from that community who really is willing to engage with you first. I think I think that comes first before you're able to translate. And, and that's important for a lot of reasons. Um, translation isn't just about language. And I think that you look at some of the Google Translate AI stuff and, and it's a really great example of that. It misses context, it misses culture, it misses so many things. And then the other question you would have is, you know, maybe you have a Spanish speaker on your team who's willing to translate into Spanish, but they speak a, you know, they are from Spain and they speak a version of Spanish that's different than maybe the community you're trying to reach. And so um, I, I think it's really important to have that partner first. And I think that's what uh, we've done in Globe. And I, I think that makes a big difference. Um, the other issue is that you want that partner there for the long term because translation isn't a one and done thing. Um, you always have updates. There's always something new coming and that translation has to update along with everything else. So it's having those long-term partnerships, I think is, is critical. It, it doesn't make sense to talk about translation until you've already had the relationship. Got it, Holly. All right, taking this topic a little further, I wanted to know what, um, I think all of you have put effort into reaching out to other kinds of underserved communities, reaching out to new communities that, that um, can you tell me more about your work in this area and, and, and what advice you give the rest of us to, to help serve new underserved communities? Well, even outside the world of uh, translation, uh, we just had an experience last week where we had a, um, where we designed a digital survey. And um, this was a survey that was supposed to be um, taken by people who were um, members of the Passamaquoddy Nation. And they looked at our survey and they said, oh no, 
this looks like it was written by a white lady. And we're like, we're sorry, it was written by a white lady. And we realized that we we did not have the proficiency to be to be, you know, write, writing that survey. You know, in terms of just, you know, the the, the language, the vernacular, it it does it, you know, it extends way beyond, you know, just what language something's written in. You know, so once again, having somebody from, you know, having stakeholders from that community, um, you know, helping you create your language is so vital. And that's something that we're going to be working on moving forward. Yeah. And as for reaching underserved communities, I think the same the answer is the same. Um, I think for us, finding partners who are already supporting those communities and know those communities um, who have the capacity to work with you. Th that's been very critical for us. We've partnered a lot with libraries, for example, because they are in the community and often providing services to the community and understand what their own community does need. Yeah, and I'll just echo partnerships. You know, we try to make iNaturalist relatively easy for groups to pick up if they've got similar kinds of goals and an interest in, in helping people record and connect to biodiversity wherever they are. Um, but iNaturalist has the reach that it does because of all of the groups in different parts of the world that reach audiences that our tiny US, largely US-based team could, could never reach directly. And I'll just build on that idea of partnership, that that's really important for the work that we do with FieldScope in really co-designing experiences for community members and what that looks like. And it's all about it being community driven, first of all, but then being a, a real thought partner in figuring out what this is going to look like and how to most effectively use the tools that are available and figure out capacity. Where's the funding kind of come from? Can we partner with you on that <laughs> um, and, and support you in whatever you need to ensure that this will be successful? Um, and, and be able to reach the community and work in the community that you want to. I'm gonna jump in here. Nice point there, Jessica, about collaboration. And it's a good, it's um, a great reminder to us that like choosing a platform is one step, but then you still have to design a project, right? And we all know the value of designing with, thank you, Laura Brandt Edson in the chat, designing with the community you hope to engage and that applies equally to project kind of evolution through time and trying to expand your audience um, as it does to a brand new project. Um, I'm jumping in because we're getting close to the end of our official time here. There were some great questions in that Q&A tool and I want you to have a chance to voice um, comment about things that, that came up in those Q&A exchanges. Was there anything in particular that any of you answered that you think we should talk about for a minute here? The question that caught my eye was how basically how hard is it to develop a platform it's like, very <laughs> and it's expensive <laughs> and that it's ongoing and informed by all of you and your needs and so i you know that's part of the the part of the learning and the ongoing development is really learning what you need so we're always happy to have a conversation with you to figure that out Good point. And as technology changes, our participants' expectations of the functionality that they'll see changes and the questions and the sophistication as the whole field evolves, we're asking different questions. Absolutely moving target. And we're all kind of growing and swimming in the same, well, in lots of different cultural soups, I suppose. Yeah, there were great, so many questions, um, and I can't even keep up with them all. So, that, and there are many answers, but um, the one I kind of dot focused in on was the question of could you address developer costs? And we've all outlined costs of these platforms and free platforms and whatevers. And so that's well known. But what if you are trying to work with and co create additional capability? And I just tried to take that lens since we've really focused on our open API these days. And we want to kind of co create this. So we, we want developers, right, to start to extend capabilities. And we're trying to go the Mozilla route, the R route, so that we don't have to build it all ourselves. And much like translation, we'd like to crowdsource the development. So um, it's just a 
program approach that we're taking. We're not there yet, but um, we have seen others build off of the API in a couple of weeks to a month, depending upon their, what they're trying to do. If they're just trying to get data out, it's 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 very simple. If they're trying to build an entire app, um, that's much more complicated. So that's a great extension too from what we heard all of you describing, which is that each of you are in one way or another working with other platforms to like kind of cover the needs of projects across multiple stages. Um, or for multiple audiences, which I think is a really exciting um, avenue forward. So we do have a few um, final announcements, just things happening out there that we want everyone who's on the call to know about. And then what we're going to do is stop the recording um, and stay and have a little bit more of an informal conversation. So we hope don't people don't leave. And if you have questions that haven't been answered, um, don't fear, we'll have some more time. So Rihanna, do you want to share this? Oh, you're awesome. Next slide. Great. So if you are part of the NASA citizen science community and or curious about the NASA citizen science community and or you just want to come hang out with Mark and me, and Mark is really great, um, join the NASA citizen science office hours and you can follow that QR code and we'll drop a link in the chat to register. You need to register because you need a Zoom link. Um, next. And those by the way are every month and that link will take you to a place where you can see the schedule. Also coming up in early October, October 5th, um, the organization that has been known as the Citizen Science Association is uh, taking a pause and celebrating 10 years of existence supporting participatory sciences. Um, you can register, follow that QR code to register to join this um, live online reflection and engagement conversation, hearing from other field leaders and members of this organization. Um, and you're gonna hear 10 one minute talks. I think this is gonna be really fun um, from visionaries poised to propel the association into a new era. We hope to see you there. Um, and then the very next day, October 6, um, proposals, the pre-proposals, first stage proposals are due. If your organization is interested in being um, the or part of the uh, new team supporting the GLOBE implementation office. So this is the project that Holly was describing. Um, this is the first time in 10 years that there has been an open proposal invitation call um, to any organization that wants to step up and lead the Globe Implementation Office. There's three parts of that, an education part, a community part, a science part, tons more information, recorded events that you can um, listen in on, slides, follow those links. Again, we'll drop them in the chat. And also, um, if you're interested in reviewing said proposals, you can also fill out a form that says, I'm interested in doing that. If you have any questions, amypchen at nasa.gov is where you'll get your answers. Next. Also, if you're interested in joining your other colleagues in this big field of citizen slash community slash participatory science, and you wanna have an in real life conversation with us, um, we are going to drop a link in the chat to fill out a little form that says, yes, I'll be at AGU. Yes, I want to help organize this. Or yes, I just want to be there. Get your name and your email address and or um, nominate others to join us. And we're going to start a, a list and figure out how we can all get together for an in real life conversation in San Francisco in December. Next. And finally. Um, we always like to learn uh, from what we do. So we hope you will take just a moment to follow this um, link. You have lots of different ways of getting there, but answer our few questions on our Mentimeter poll to let us know um, how this event um, met your needs. And we hope to hear from you there. And with that, thank you all speakers. You were wonderful. It's so exciting. I've been in this space for long enough to know or recognize just how far you and we have all come in the decades it's been since I've known you and known about your platforms. And it's just really exciting for this community. I second what Mark said about thanks for opening science up to so many more people and through all the different ways and all the different avenues that your platforms do. So thank you ever so much. And we'll see you soon at one of those events.
And Brianna, we can 